Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam, and on behalf of Book Soup, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for tonight's event with Ben Rhodes in conversation with Alex Wagner, here to discuss After the Fall, Being American in the World We've Made. Tonight's event will end with a Q&A, and to submit a question, please use the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. If you see a question on the list that you'd like for our speakers to answer, please click the Like button, and we'll try to answer as many questions as time will allow. And please also feel free to engage with each other and the conversation and readings in the chat area as you already are. We'll be hosting more virtual events in the near future and you can learn more about them by our, on our website by signing up for our email newsletter as well as following us on social media at BookSoup. And you can also follow us here on our Crowdcast page. Our next event is this coming Monday, 6 p.m. PST with Lisa Tadeo in conversation with Stephanie Dandler discussing her latest novel, Animal. And past events are also available on our YouTube channel, which you can subscribe to if you feel so called. Also, please support Book Soup and Ben tonight by purchasing a copy of tonight's featured book, which you can do by clicking the green button right below the viewer screen. It'll redirect you to our website where you can finish the checkout process. And we are also selling digital audiobooks and ebooks through Libro FM and Kobo for those interested. It's a really important time, as always, to support indie bookstores. So if you haven't got the book yet, please consider Book Soup. And we are also open in, for in-store browsing if you are local to Los Angeles. So if you are able to come by, you can come by to the store from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. daily. And we'd love to see you. And of course, we're available online 24 seven. So with that said, let me introduce our guests for this evening. Ben Rhodes is the author of the New York Times bestseller, The World As It Is, co-host of Pod Save the World, a contributor for NBC News and MSNBC, and an advisor to former President Barack Obama. Alex Wagner, our um, In Conversation guest tonight, is co-host and executive producer of Showtime's The Circus, a national correspondent for CBS News, and a contributing editor to The Atlantic. She lives in New York City. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn the camera over to Ben and Alex. Thank you both so much for being with Book Soup tonight. Please sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation. Thank you, Book Soup. You can hear a phone ringing in the background and I'm not gonna answer it. <laughs> ben. Congratulations on an amazing book, which can we say now officially is a New York another New York Times bestseller? Is that public news? Yes, it's uh, number three, Alex. So amazing and so so earned, so well earned. Um, I will say I am full disclosure in a hotel quarantine on the other side of the earth, and I have had nothing well, few things, but your book to get me through, <laughs> and it's been a hard time, not not because the book is without hope, but because it's such a masterful, um, gimlet-eyed look at what's happening in the world. And it places foreign policy um, in a really personal and visceral context. And that's kind of where I want to begin. You have this kind of master thesis that um, America and the American-led order never in the post-Cold War period gave people a sense of identity, something to belong to, basically a reason to believe. And autocracy and nationalism has basically filled that, va that vacuum. I think for a lot of people that notion exists in the abstract. Um, but one of the things I love about your book is there are these vignettes that make it so real. So I wanna start with one of those. Um, as we're talking about Russia, which is a place with an autocratic nationalistic, uh, hold on, government in place, you have this anecdote and it was it's from a time when you were not in government you're a young man and you go to a place called kaliningrad which is a slice of russia that's not actually in russia it's sandwiched between i think poland and lithuania and so that's where this takes place and for our audience i'm going to read the, this little excerpt because i think it it reveals a lot about why and how nationalism has flourished in this period okay so this has been traveling to Kaliningrad. We ended our time in Kaliningrad by boarding an overnight bus that would take us to Warsaw. As we climbed on, I noticed that nearly all of the other passengers were older women carrying giant plastic shopping bags. The shopping bags were full of vodka and cartons of cigarettes, and my more worldly and Russian-speaking companion deduced from eavesdropping and clipped conversation that these women made a living buying these goods at Kaliningrad prices and then selling them for a profit on the Polish side of the border. There was a tension in the quiet of the bus as we drove to a checkpoint at the border where we were told to get off with our things. As we stepped off, the older women started running as fast as they could, clutching their bags tightly. 
They were pursued by the few border guards present. And I saw that this drama was a simple numbers game. There were far more women than guards. So even though the guards could easily tackle a few to the ground, most of the women escaped into the darkness to reap the few dollars to be made on a black market that had emerged over the previous decade. Russian women running into a country that Russians only recently ruled to participate in the crudest form of capitalism, people's wives and mothers and sisters. From the country that produced Dostoevsky, that won World War II and sent the first satellite into space. Standing there, even in my youth and naivete, I experienced a brief wave of what it must have felt like to be Russian in that time a feeling not dissimilar to what one must have felt growing up in the shadow of the House of Soviets, a sense of bottomless humiliation and unutterable rage. I just felt so viscerally the sadness and hollowness. You understand in that moment why Putin has the power that he does. Tell me more about that. I'm so glad that, 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 that you, know, uh, you, you started there, Alex, in a strange way. Um, you know, because I was, uh, I, I was trying, you know, in the book I talk about and take people through these different strains of nationalism, you know, in Hungary and Russia and China and in America. And I was trying to figure out where to start the Russia story. Um, and I had Russian characters, which I'll get to in a second, but I, I, I never got that image out of my head. You know, it's like something I saw, I was 23 at the time, I think. And it's like one of those rare images that I can still see it now in my head like it just happened. Um, and, you know, what was so interesting to me is that we Americans, and I talk about this in the book, like, you know, when the Cold War ended, my assumption on the other side of the world was this is good for everybody. You know, that freedom and capitalism is going to kind of wash across the soil and water a thousand seeds um, and, and that's it. Like, that's the end of history. And, um, you know, what we didn't consider was the, the depths of that sense of humiliation and what that, what kind of underground rivers of grievance um, that, that plants underneath the society. And one of my characters is Alexei Navalny, who's now in prison in Russia. He's the chief opponent uh, to Vladimir Putin. He's been incredibly courageous, but he's been poisoned and in prison now. And when I was talking to him on, on FaceTime like this, <laughs> like um, uh, in, the, in the middle of lockdown, he, you know, he told me a story of being a kid and having been told his whole life, um, and he's roughly my age, you know, that he was growing up in the greatest country in the world, the country that had sent Sputnik into space, the country that you know, stood for and what they believed were the right values of communism and kind of world liberation. Um, and then it came crashing down. He described it around this one moment when he and his family, they were a military family, were sent army rations from the West German army. And he described the kind of humiliation of, you know, Germany, the country they defeated, is now sending candy to Russian children, which obviously they, you know, was this act of goodwill, but, but he took it as this kind of act of, of profound humiliation. Um, and and the, the policy, overlay to that, right, is in the 1990s at the same time, you know, the idea was, okay, Russia should just privatize everything. And so they sold off basically all of the entities of the Russian state, the national telecommunications companies, the national oil companies, and they were totally corrupt fire sales, basically, that, you know, we in the United States encouraged because it was privatization. And it basically just enriched a whole bunch of billionaires, which created even kind of compounded this anger because you've already had the humiliation of losing the Soviet Union in the Cold War, and then you're seeing all these billionaires get rich. Um, and Putin tapped into that. He tapped into that anger over the defeat of the Soviet Union and the corruption. Now, ingeniously, he also enriched himself because he buddied up to a bunch of these billionaires who were you know, buying up the state assets. Many of them were former KGB like him. Um, and so he managed to both get his hands on the resources and get his arms around that anger. And that those two things, his ability to kind of work corruption uh, to finance his project and his ability to kind of harness those grievances explain, I think, very much why we are where we are today. 
But what do you think it counts? Because it's great that you went to Navalny because that was my second question. You know, th there are other men and women who have faced that humiliation, who have seen once great empires, their homelands reduced to uh, effective rubble. And yet their response has been different. Navalny's response to this is decidedly different than Putin's. What is it that accounts for that split? to take the rage and channel it into a zeal for anti-corruption, to look at the system and say, this thing needs to be changed holistically better and to be more accountable to the people. So this is the, the mystery of human beings. Um, and I, I wrestle with this. You know, in, in the hungry section, I, I kind of juxtaposed the story of Viktor Orban, who became the kind of corrupt autocrat there, with uh, a, a younger guy named Chandra Letterer, and they're describing a lot of the same grievances about globalization's failures and its failure to offer a sense of traditional belonging, the system being kind of rigged for the wealthy, um, the, 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 the letdown of uh, democracy not delivering everything they wanted. Orban chooses to channel that into nationalism. Shandor channeled that into starting an anti-corruption organization, right? And Navalny was very similar. He went into politics. Um, he joined one of the more liberal parties, and he started to see the corruption around him, and it just made him angry. And he described being in Moscow, and like all these neighborhoods are getting leveled, and skyscrapers are going up, and it's totally corrupt. They're not compensating the people who have been kicked out of their homes. If you go to a court to try to block these developments, uh, Navalny said, you know, you find out pretty fast that the judge is on the take. If you push too hard, he describes basically kind of mafia style intimidation, people coming and roughing you up. And this is in like the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and Navalny decided, I'm going to take on the system, you know, and, and whereas Putin decided, I'm going to enter into this system. I'm going to completely, what's so interesting about Putin is, you know, he served communism. He instead made a decision, oh, well, I'm actually going to completely kind of hack capitalism. I'm going to find a way to work within this kind of system of, corruption and national security to kind of get the levers of power. Whereas what Navalny did is, was so subversive. He bought a bunch of shares in each of the Russian national oil companies, and he sued them each <laughs> to basically be able to get the documents that could prove that tens of billions of dollars were being siphoned off at the, by the middleman, essentially, who was always a Putin crony. And that was the kind of beginning of his political ascent. But I do think that you know, if there's hope in the book, in a way, one of the hopes is actually this question in, in the sense that human beings have agency. We, we can choose who we want to be. We can be like Putin or like Navalny. Like, we can choose to just accept the corruption of a system and then try to manipulate it to our own ends, or we can choose to actually stand up for things that we believe in and channel our anger, our frustration, or our sense of grievance into a support for a different kind of system, and, and in my view, a democratic system. Um, and, and I think that part of the challenge that we've confronted in the world is in part because these issues did seem settled. A lot of people, I think more people than not, would prefer to live in the, the democratic world. But I think people got incredibly complacent. You know, it was like, well, and, and I heard this from people everywhere that, well, we thought that things were just moving in the right direction. And yeah. so while the Putins of the world are kind of rejiggering the system to their ends, we're all, you know, doing our own thing. We're not seeing this as the existential struggle that the Cold War was. And, and then we kind of begin to look up over the last decade and it's getting darker and darker outside, you know? And, um, and, and so my, my hope is that people recognize like, no, we have a choice here. Um, the Putins of the world want us to believe that this is inevitable. Um, they want us to be apathetic or cynical, but but every person can choose. Do they want to take a path of a Navalny or the path of a Putin? You, to that question of inevitability, you uh, propose, uh, one of your associates who is unnamed in the book, proposes one of the most compelling ideas about sort of like how we got where we are, which is this idea of the elongated reason cycle. If you know, you know. I'm, I told you, Ben, I'm going to make tote bags yeah. that say this. I fully plan on it because it's it really explains so much about how we are where we are. And I do want to get to the kind of structural reasons why we are, we are where we are, a lot of them made in America. But this idea of the elongated reason cycle, I'll let you put the finer points on it, generally is 
accounts for the post World War II, you know, American led order as a vestige of the entire global community peering into the abyss after World War II and seeing what happens when you, you let fascism run amok. And like, we looked at the darkest side of the coin, pulled ourselves back and good things, progress started to happen, but that progress was not going to ever be forever. It was never going to be inevitable. And I guess, talk to me a little bit about that because you are someone who served in the administration of an individual who became known for, not his phrase, but one that was uttered a lot in the Obama era, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And um, that seems to be at odds with the notion of an elongated reason cycle, which basically says, you know, at some at some point, the age of reason and enlightenment is going to end. I'm so sorry about this telephone. That's all right. Uh, so I so it was interesting because I put this question to this guy about like you know I was putting the question to everybody why have we seen this rise of nationalism, and and most people started their answers around like the 2008 financial crisis or maybe you know the end of the Cold War, and you know this guy said and I'd been struck by the way in um in, in working on this book. But at the, the extent to which, you know, the, the nationalism of a Orban or Putin is really a blood and soil nationalism in the past, the kind of dark stuff that led to places like World War II. And he said to me, look, you know, the, his theory of everything was that the shock of World War II and the Holocaust, of where that leads, of where nationalism leads, of where that kind of identity-based ethno-nationalism leads, it was such a shock to people that people put up guardrails. They're like, we can't do this. You know, we have to, we have to set up institutions. We have to set up international institutions. We have to embrace international laws. We have to, we have to build a whole system to prevent the next one of these wars. And, and also, by the way, we should put in place additional protections for human rights, at least in the democratic world, in part because of the shock of the Holocaust. And, and that that's essentially the liberal order, right? That, that everything from the United Nations to, to human rights law to, to what have you. And it made me also take a journey back to my childhood because I remember meeting this incredible guy that, that, that my family came to know named Peter Karpenstein, who was a German and his father had been a Nazi um, and like an like early Nazi. And, and when Peter was a child, he talks about his father appearing like an apparition from the, the Eastern front at the end of the war barely able to walk, you know, he's walked home from s some awful experience and he's carrying a, a pair of shoes for his son. And Peter ended up living in miniature, the elongated reason cycle, because he moved to Brussels. He went to work for the European Union as a lawyer and he devoted his life to this project. He never moved back to Germany. Um, he, and I remember going to his house, he had Mein Kampf on the, the bookshelf as a warning. Not because he agreed with it, because we need to remember this. This is where it can go. And, and he built this institution, the European Union, or he helped build it. But Peter's dead. You know, he died a few years ago. And the point that my friend made and that I thought about is that that generation, we don't have it in our memory. We, we, we don't have the historical memory. We can read about it all we want. But the freshness of the lived experience of those horrors is gone. And I don't think it's a coincidence that as we move out of that historical memory, this kind of blood and soil nationalism, ethno-nationalism, whether you're talking about a Putin in Russia or Trump in the United States or Xi Jinping in China or Narendra Modi in India or Tayyip Erdogan in Turkey, like these are very familiar characters from history. Um, we just thought we'd move past them, but maybe as we no longer have that memory, the doors opened again. Um, and to the Obama point, and he raises this with me, and he basically says, you know, he's a character in the book too, as you know, and he's like, look, every generation has to have like a version of the same competition throughout history. Um, and sometimes you win and sometimes you lose, right? Um, it just right now, the stakes feel particularly high, which I think accounts for the intensity uh, of our political moment in this country and around the world. I always love Barack Obama's optimism. Like the the the, the source, he always gives me the feeling that like it like it's okay because this has happened before. He gives this kind yeah. of reassuring cyclical um, diagnosis, and yet you outline a bunch of sort of other circumstances that accompany this rise in nationalism that are very different than any other time 
uh, for human civilization. And that's where I want to talk about technology, right? Yeah, because, yeah, yeah. you know, um, let, let's just start with the way in which America unleashed via Silicon Valley, this just raft of new technology with the assumption that it was going to connect all of us and it would inevitably be for good and it could not be misused. And, and what it's done has great, like euphemistically, just totally destabilized the world. And you see that in your travels in Russia, to some degree in China, um, where there's so much, if at best, confusion over what is right, right and wrong, even if you aren't taking the bait of the propagandists and the sort of you know, purveyors of, of dark material, you don't know what to believe anymore. You've lost your sort of moral compass. You don't know where the right side is and where the left side is. And it feels to me like that's resulted in a population that has either given up or, or or looked away because and and then that's and that's part of the point or just become completely apathetic and that is very useful for autocrats is it not? Yeah. So I, I, there's a Russian flavor to this and a Chinese flavor to this, and I think that the the Chinese one is ultimately more consequential. But to start with the Russian one, I mean, what Putin did is these tools that were seen as you know the ultimate tools of empowerment and connection and informing human beings, and they were for a time. Putin realizes these can be the perfect tools of social control. Um, and what it really is, and we've experienced this in the United States, is it's the destruction of objective reality. There is no reality. What Putin does, it's not one conspiracy theory, it's a million conspiracy theories. As one Russian described to me in the book, life becomes terrifyingly flexible because there are all these realities around you and they all basically serve the purpose of Putin because he's flooding the zone of these social media platforms. I mean, Navalny explained to me you know, there's a whole narrative about him that he's an enemy of the Russian state. There's also a whole narrative about him that he's a double agent who works with the FSB, you know. Um, and that's, you know, to make people think things are so disorienting. Um, and within that system of Putin can thrive. And that's what we're living through in the United States, a lack of an agreed upon reality, you know, because the overwhelming amount of information that at least a portion of this country is receiving is not reality. It's something that someone is intentionally misleading them with. I think that though the more difficult realization I had in writing this book is, is about China and the degree to which that is the future that we're currently pointed towards, although it's by no means inevitable. And you know what they basically did is they built a parallel internet. They took all these same tools and just kind of engineered them and they combined them with uh, like the, not just a propaganda tool, but the data collection and artificial intelligence tool. Now, the extreme version of this is where a million Uyghurs are in concentration camps. But the, the, the version I really inhabit is Hong Kong, because Hong Kong is this place where people you know, were relatively free uh, about 15 years ago. And the, the description that these young people in Hong Kong who I spoke to gave me is one of a technology kind of encroaching, like this kind of invisible force, where as the Chinese Communist Party is getting more intrusive in the affairs of Hong Kong, which they're supposed to leave alone, it's like... And if you want a good job, you know, you, you want to be able to, you know, your lawyer want to go to a good job at a law firm or you want to get into a good university, like, don't criticize the Chinese government on social media. That's kind of where it starts. And then it becomes like, well, actually, don't even visit certain websites because they're collecting that data too. And then it becomes like, don't even email people things that are political because they might be monitoring your email for certain keywords. Uh, and then over time, this was described to me, it had a term in Hong Kong, white terror, where like you have to self-censor. You have to self-censor what you, what you, information you access, what you say. And ultimately, what all these young people told me is that, wait a second, they're trying to engineer what we can think. Because if you can't say certain things and you, the incentives are so overwhelming to be a certain way, which is to not think about politics, to leave that to the Chinese Communist Party, that's ultimately going to change how you are wired to think. And the desperation of that protest movement was people being like, we want to be left alone. And that, that's how they described it to me. And, and I think we have to reckon as a society with the idea that this combination of capitalism and technology and totalitarianism is kind of where like the momentum is moving. You know, I mean, here in this country, When's the last time you saw a movie that's critical of the Chinese Communist Party? I mean, well, no studio yeah. would make that movie because they worry about the Chinese market. Um, I was aware of the fact that in government, you know, you don't go, you know, you dial down a little bit your critique of these things because you don't want the Chinese to kind of like 
kick kick out a bunch of U.S. businesses. You, you, I tell the story of the in the NBA like getting in trouble because of a single tweet about Hong Kong that cost them billions of dollars. So the, the, we're actually already self censoring here. Never mind, by the way, the fact that here our flavor of it is like Amazon knows plenty about me too and is trying to shape what I think to buy certain things. It's not nearly as nefarious as Hong Kong, but but so I think we have to we have to catch up to where things well, are going. Well, but it, it is more, I mean, the, 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 the economic ties between the U.S. and China have created a real incentive for self-censorship. I mean, the story you tell about the owner of the Houston Rockets who sends, who tweets a message of support for Hong Kong becomes an international affair, right? And he ultimately is the one that has to apologize because the Chinese government isn't happy about that because of the interlinkage between the Houston Rockets and the Chinese government having to do with Yao Ming. I'm getting too far afield. Yeah, but the yeah. fact is, you know, we have enough of a vested interest in the, the Chinese helping the American economy that if China doesn't like something, if China in a, a Disney show wants to see the Chinese border extended through the South China Sea, which I believe it it did, right? Like, yeah, yeah, just did, like did, yeah. they, they'll use every opportunity to cement what for the, the the aims of the communist party whether it's a disney movie whether it's a tweet or whether it's something um sort of more deeply existential and i think americans don't fully understand that right it's like you hear tell of you know business owners bristling at the the sort of restrictions being put upon them by the chinese government but that's actually an extension of this greater project that they have going they on in the market because they want in you know i mean that's the whole point is that we've chosen this i mean uh, you know, I tell the story in the China section. I start with a guy who was in Tiananmen Square, whose father was a very senior Communist Party member, but wanted to reform and wanted to dialogue with the students. I mean, I kind of start with that moment when it looked like the Chinese system was under pressure. And I, I thread all the way through to the Hong Kong protest, which is kind of the symbol of this China that is beginning to not just emerge, but it's beginning to extend outward. And, you know, how to describe this. I mean, I, I, I tell the story in the book of like this episode when I'm in Shanghai in 27 with Barack Obama after he's president and I get woken up in the middle of the night and it's Chinese officials who want to warn me in my hotel room, not unlike, you know, your hotel room there. It's like, you know, the, the universal curtains and the whole thing. Yeah, but you can leave. Uh, yeah, I can leave. I wasn't quarantined. Um, they warned me that Barack Obama should not meet the Dalai Lama on his upcoming trip to India. And that was creepy already because it was like 10 o'clock in my hotel room, but I had not, we had not announced the meeting with the Dalai Lama. Um, I mean, they were letting me basically know they're, they're in somebody's email, mine, the Dalai Lama's guy, probably both of us. So that, that's a little un, unsettling. So I walk outside and I'm looking at Shanghai and Shanghai looks like the future. It's like the skyline is like, you know, futuristic skyscrapers, lights everywhere, people are taking selfies. It's in some ways a magnificent creation of the post-Cold War era, you know, that's created a lot of prosperity and lifted people out of poverty. But you're also looking at it, I'm looking at it and thinking, if you took like what America has been about in the world for the last 30 years, if you took our profit motive and, and the spread of capitalism, and you took our kind of national security fixation, particularly post 9-11, the, the need to kind of control against any threat. And you took our mania for technology, right? Embedded in all those selfies. And you just stripped out all the democracy. This is what you get, what I was looking at. That this was like the logical next step, you know, it was the British empire to the Americans to this. And then if you think about it, we've chosen that. What have we prioritized in our relationship with the Chinese government? Can anybody say that the American government, American businesses, American cultural institutions have not prioritized profit in China, access to the Chinese market over democracy? Of course we have. And I was a part of it. Uh, you know, and, I, like, and I wrestled with that in the book. And, you know, we, we, that we made these choices, you know, and, and, and not just a government, not just presidents, like societally, we made these choices. And maybe it's because we never thought it would come to this, but here we are, right? And and, and I, I I'm part of what I argue is like now we have to make a different set of choices. Yeah, I'm not going to defend uh, the Obama administration and its dealings with China, but 
and you know, part of it was saving the U.S. economy is yeah. why. Oh, yeah. you, and the other was, <laughs> and I think another existential threat, which is climate change, right? And yeah. you're very explicit saying, look, I mean, do you, you, you have the Uyghurs on one hand, you have the Tibetans on the same hand, and then you have, you know, global collapse in the form of climate change. And, and you guys, you know, chose climate change. And I think that there are some people, you know, people are going to disagree with you. People are going to agree with you, but these are kind of the choices at hand when we're yeah. talking about China, which is no. why it makes it so difficult, I think. Yeah. And, and I, I walk people through that. I, I walk people through that. That was the thinking. The first term, we needed China to help us get out of the financial crisis. And the second term, we wanted to get to the Paris Agreement. Um, and those choices made sense in the same way that Bill Clinton's choices made sense, in the same way that George Bush's choices, I mean, in, to them at least, made sense. Like, but we have to realize that we did make these choices and that I could probably defend every one of them. Like Bill Clinton wanted a lower cost for American consumers and he wanted access to that Chinese market. George Bush you know, wanted Chinese cooperation in the war on terror. That's a whole other thing, which I think is more problematic, um, but also wanted to kind of continue this economic growth model that was, you know, our growth model has been very tied up with China for years. Barack Obama wanted these things, but like collectively the deep prioritization of democracy over that long a period of time I mean, I describe in the book, too, there are these kind of gatekeepers to China, right? The, the Hank Paulsons and Mike Bloomberg's and, and their advice is basically, Henry Kissinger most notably, like their advice, if you really listen to it, is kind of like, just do whatever the Chinese want, because then you'll yeah. make a lot of money. You know, I mean, that, that, that's kind of been the, the backdrop to this whole thing. And, and by the way, the Americans who really made money were Americans who already had money. It, it's Americans who had portfolios. Um, and therefore, the, the, the way in which the stock market has been juiced by the U.S.-China relationship over the last two or three decades like, was good for them. But you know what? A lot of the people who are angry, including some people who turned to Trump, are people who they saw that. <laughs> They're like, wait a second. Like, what, what's in this for the rest of us here? Like, you keep saying it's so important that this relationship be so stable. And, and look, I'm also not someone who thinks that the answer to this is some big cold war with China. I think the answer about this is, first of all, like at home, at home, we have to change who we are, right? Like we have to, we have to prioritize democracy above everything else here. Like we haven't done that here. And, and I am very much believe that the most important thing America can do for the world in terms of democracy is set a democratic example. Then I think what, part of what we can just do is forthrightly state our opinion. There's a mm -hmm. reason that China doesn't want us to talk about these things, right? There's a reason that when the, the GM of the Houston Rockets tweets about Hong Kong, they shut down the entire NBA. If they weren't nervous about having a debate, they wouldn't do that. Part of what we need to do is just say what we think about what's happening to the Uyghurs, to say what we think about what's happening in Hong Kong. And yes, I think part of it is, at times, you have to draw some lines and say, you know what? No American money is allowed to invest in these policies that are supporting this surveillance. So. But I, so I don't think the answer is kind of this belligerent kind of uh, foreign policy. I think the answer is like, do we really care about these things? And, 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 and you know, does that, is that inform everything that we do at home? And does that inform the way in which, the window through which we engage the rest of the world? I guess I, I want to get into the, I mean, you, you, a lot of that rests upon the individual or, you know, the individual within an administration who has power to change the 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 tilt of an administration. I'm a cord, just so you know, I'm not leaving you. Okay. I'm just uh, not wanting Bye. to. It was so great that. talking to I you. Know, I'm back. I'm back. This is the wonders of a virtual book event. And you um, see the, the red light on your battery. Yes. I had to take the hotel phone off the hook because they kept calling me to make sure I'm, I'm still alive. Um, so um, the. I think one of the, the the darker parts of the book, though, is reading about your experience being someone who's working on a larger project for the global good, the Iran nuclear deal, and and what happens as a result of you know unchecked wealth and consolidated power and the tools that those wealthy and in power can use to undermine their adversaries, to unwind progress. I mean. I think it's important to talk about that. And in the same time that we're talking about, you know, trying to take different postures, trying to change the the sort of stance we have with regards to some of these, um, you know, nations like China, it is it comes at a cost. And you bore a particularly personal cost um, when you were entangled with Black Cube. So tell for people who don't know that story, can you can you tell it? And also, you know, I know you come to the, well. 
Let me tell that story first, and then I'll so, ask you. Uh, yeah, the, the, what was interesting to me is, you know, I, um, I, I, I woke up one morning, I checked the news, um, this is where I guess I'll start it, and there was a story in, like, The Guardian that said, um, Black Cube, this Israeli, former, former outfit of former Mossad operatives, that had actually already been in the news because they kind of spied on and tried to discredit Harvey Weinstein's accusers, um, this kind of private espionage for hire firm, that they'd been hired by, quote unquote, Trump associates to dig up dirt on me uh, because of the Iran nuclear deal. Um, and then I had this kind of very strange couple of days when the media descends on the story. Um, I talked to Ronan Farrow, you know, who kind of had been on the black cube beat because of Harvey Weinstein. He kind of directs me to find some emails where they'd like emailed my wife and said they, they were making a film about the personal lives of people that had worked on nuclear negotiations in government. And could she share her personal experience? You know, like this was not subtle. Then I heard from journalists, because then of course journalists are getting their hands on these files, right? Um, oh, you know, you're, you're, there's a photo of your car in there and your parents' phone number. And I mean, the whole thing is kind of deeply unsettling. And then it kind of drifts out of the news cycle, you know? Um, and a couple of things happened subsequent. I mean, there were a lot. I mean, I, I then also, like, around the same time, my, literally right around the same time, my first book comes out. And my, my agent calls me, my literary agent, and she's like, hey, you got to clean up your, your Google's a dumpster fire. <laughs> you know, like, the, you Google Ben Rhodes and, like, some, some pretty dark stuff comes up. And I'm like, yeah, I know, I know. I've been, like, a bit of a villain to the American right. And she's like, well, you know, you should talk to one of these people who cleans up your reputation online. I was like, oh, that sounds kind of gross. Um, but I talked to this guy, and, and he's like, you know, I, I, I call him back, and I'm like, I, I don't want to do this. this I, I, like, it just doesn't feel like something I want to do. And he's like, well, it's probably a good thing because it would cost you, like, and he quoted some insane amount of money. Um, and I was like, well, why? And he's like, because somebody's doing to you what we would do for you. And essentially what they would do for me is that they would click relentlessly on positive stories about me to make the Google algorithm think that that's the most important thing about me, to populate you know, the first page of Google with great stuff about me. And by the way, Google celebrities, and you'll see a lot of people must use this kind of service. And he's like, someone has been relentlessly doing that to you because the top post about me on Google, which I think may still be the case today, is like a blog post from like eight years ago that just says Ben Rhodes is an asshole in the title which is like what they want to do, just the worst stuff so that you're kind of tarred. And, you know, then I kind of talked to journalists and poked around who hired these people, what is this? And then I realized at the end of the day, it almost didn't matter. Whether it was the Trump people or the Gulf Arab governments that I'd pissed off or the right-wing Israeli government that didn't like me. or some, There are powerful people with a lot of money who are manipulating, you know, who have private espionage firms and manipulate the Google algorithm to create their own reality. Like, it's not disconnected from China because what it's about is just money and power. Um, and, and it's not even about ideology, right? And, and one of the conversations I had with a Chinese, uh, a Chinese guy was like, look, the 20th century was about these ideologies, communism, fascism, democracy, and capitalism. The 21st century is just kind of about identity politics and, and who has the money and who has the power. Like Putin, what is Putin's ideology? What, what, what even is Trump's ideology beyond, obviously he uses nationalism, but what, it's not connected to some vision of how the world should operate. And so that black cube thing was so dispiriting because it made the degree to which kind of power has just corrupted um, things. It turned me off. The experience, I had been someone in power, but it kind of turned me off. It made me want to go be with these people who are opposing power um, mm -hmm. in some intangible way. Well, I think for other people though, it could also have the effect of demor like demoralizing you is kind of the point and, yeah. and, and, and turning you away from Paul, like, even if you're a bystander, oh, politics is so ugly and sorted. Like I, I want nothing to do which with that. Which is the point, which is the point. I mean, and I write in the book, Alex said like, what I actually finally realized about the black cube thing is they wanted that to get out. They probably put it out themselves. Because the point was intimidation. The point wasn't to to uncover a secret on me and what, like leak the secret to somebody. And no, the point was to have it get out. You're being spied on, right? Like we're you know we're watching you. There's no length that we won't go to, right? 
that's what these people that's why that's why putin poisons people in third countries we you're not say, that's why this belarus airliner got or this belarus oppositionist basically had his airplane hijacked and they want you to feel like it's not worth it and and part of what i found hope in the book is that every the people i'm meeting whether they're hong kong protesters or Navalny, but there are people out there facing far greater shit than we are who are like it is worth it you know um and you know i i i still believe that there are enough people who believe it's worth it that that history doesn't have to lead in that direction you have this amazing anecdote in the book. I mean, I think it's often that this war over identity, right, feels very abstract and that misinformation feels very one sided. You're like either you're the recipient of this kind of churn on the Internet or on social media. You don't understand the people who are on the other side buying it or or peddling it. And you were equally involved in a conspiracy theory around Benghazi. And it's the first time in the book where I really sense like the con the awkward confrontation between the sort of believers of this garbage and these lies and the the person who's at the center, the victim who's at the center of those lies. And you're writing, I think your first book, you're writing your chapter on Benghazi at a bed and breakfast, and you are in the bed and breakfast with a person who is a believer in all the conspiracies about you in Benghazi. I wonder, like, if you think that that in retrospect was actually an important thing to have to confront. I mean, I know you, I don't know that anybody changed anybody else's mind, but I wonder, I mean, I think part of the problem in all of this is the facelessness and we're unable to communicate with one another about what actually objective truth is. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a totally bizarre experience because I'm, I'm, I'm in this bed and breakfast, I'm the only guest and the nice woman who's kind of making the breakfast and keeping me in, um, is, you know, eager to make conversation and kind of extracts from me that I'm writing something and I was in the Obama administration, but not who I am. And, and then, you know, it involves, she's a Trump supporter and we have kind of an earnest conversation about illegal immigration. And then she starts talking about how she's been doing research online and, you know, George Soros is the devil. And did I know about Benghazi? And I said, well, let's sit down and talk about Benghazi, you know, <laughs> and she, you know, we went through the whole conspiracy theory and I, like I'm like I'm casual, carefully, politely rebutting every version of, you know, all the horrible things that she thought I did. And I kept cutting her off and saying, hey, I feel a little uncomfortable. Like if you knew who I was, you wouldn't like me. And she's like, no, no, you're so nice. This is such a nice let's chat. And so I had this weird experience of talking. And by the way, at the end of the conversation, she's like, well, if nothing bad happened in Benghazi, then why are all these special forces guys and former generals on Fox News said that, right? Um, you know, credible voices matter. Um, and the next day, I was terrified to go downstairs because I know she was going to Google me. She was going to look in that register and figure out who I was. And she was horrified that she had shared these views with me. I was horrified because I didn't want her to think, you know, I was the monstrous person that she probably thought Ben Rhodes was before she met me. And we had this kind of lovely moment and her sister's a liberal and likes me, and we took a selfie together, and it was a very human interaction of just trying to reassure each other that we still liked each other despite, obviously, these differences. But it was also kind of creepy. I mean, so the, the hope in that is that, yes, she's a human being, and she was a good person. And, or, or like, well, put it, I'll put it this way. Like, we're all people who have good elements and some lots of good elements, and, but she fundamentally, I think, was a decent human being. Um, she, you know, and, and so that does speak to the notion of like, if we actually look at each other and see each other, we can at least remember that, remember that we have something in common. Um, but the downside of that is like, well, even this decent person is just kind of in an information ecosystem that I don't, I don't even know what goes on in there. You know, like I can't, or if I do, it kind of, I, you know, and, 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 and it's not equivalent to MSNBC. I mean, I used to bother me, Alex, when my former boss, Barack Obama, would say, well, some people live in the reality of Fox and some. Well, that's true. But like ours has some tether to facts. Like we may be wrong. As a former sure. MSNBC host, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, as an MSNBC, we may I was be, not inventing shit. Yeah, we may be wrong about a bunch of stuff, but we're not positing that the world is run by a secret government of child sex traffickers like you and I. Right. We're not saying that like 
the election was stolen in 2016, like by what, you know, Venezuelan voting machines or something, right? And, and that's a problem, but it's a problem that suggests a solution, right? Which is that the way in which media and technology has been manipulated in a way to make that woman believe stuff, that can be fixed. There have been all kinds of inventions throughout American history that were bad for public safety. Like it wasn't safe to drive without seatbelts and then we put on seatbelts. Like Facebook is not a safe, is not a safe platform because it is giving half this country their information and it is choosing through its business model to funnel the most provocative information possible to people because it gets the most engagement, which gets the most clicks, which gets the most ad revenue. When Donald Trump lost his ability to do that and started a blog, nobody went to that. It yeah. failed because nobody, we keep being told people want Trump. Well, they didn't want him bad enough to go there. But when Trump is fed to you, you respond to it. You respond either agreeing with him or you know, fighting with him. And, and to me, that just shows you that there actually is a, yes, we both have to have the human conversation like I had with that woman, but we also have to solve this problem of why is someone like her living in a different universe? She, I don't, I honestly don't believe she chose, I don't think she chose a decade ago to go down a pathway to thinking the things that she thought when I met her. I think that that kind of happened to her. Well, I think you, I mean, you, you touched on it a little bit and I want to go, I want to talk about this in the sort of solutions <laughs> like trajectory of this book before we get to questions, which we will have a few minutes for. And, and that's this idea of like the reason people are attracted to Fox News, the reason people are attracted to Trump is because it's giving them sen some sense of belonging and identity. The thing that we started talking about at the very beginning of this conversation, right? How do you replace, if you, if you, if you, if you feel adrift and alone, and then you finally find this community of people who are like-minded, who give you a sort of visceral sense of like worth, that's intoxicating, right? That's what we all want as human beings. That's to some degree human nature. Your uh, family friend, Peter Karpenstein, who sounds like he was an awesome person. Awesome, Anybody yeah. that's yeah. out <laughs> champagne for breakfast is yeah. positive, positive force for good in my life. Yeah. Um, but he talked about, it's important to create alternative identities from communities of chosen values. And, and time and time again, you've, you've talked to these activists who forge communities in sort of much more localized yes. um, senses, right? And, and I, I feel like if there is the, the work to be done for all of us, right, to combat this nationalism that's so intoxicating, this rage that's being peddled by right-wing media or the chaos that's being sown by social media is to forge and, and support smaller communities founded not on national profit or nationalism, but on like deeply, it's like more moral value. And the question then is how and where do we find those? You write really glancingly of your Pod Save, um, Pod Save the World podcast as I think you, what did you call it? Tiny, a tiny piece of real estate in the vast wasteland of American discourse. <laughs> Shit, don't tell John Favreau that. Yeah, but, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. you know, like if that's, I mean, that's a community, right? Yes. And that feels like it's a pot, but, but you, you position that, that kind of community as, as just so, I'm not going to say futile, but so small compared to the machinery, the existentially evil machinery that's at the doorstep. I guess like, here's how I'd cast this in the most hopeful way, right? Because I, I talked to some young, I talked to a young Hungarian who was born right around the end of the Cold War. And she describes growing up as like Viktor Orban is tra transforming Hungary into this kind of right-wing national state. And she's looking around and she's like, I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> like, I don't, like this Hungarian identity they're talking about doesn't seem relevant to me. And she's like, I think I can be Hungarian and I can be European and I can belong to kind of a local community of people that are like-minded. And, and I don't think I have to define my identity as superior to somebody else's. Like, just didn't make any sense to her. And then she's basically a, a grad student who then goes off to start a, a career. And then Hungary was going to host the Olympics. And everybody knew this was going to be just a corrupt boondoggle, all the stuff we've been talking about. Putin had hosted the Olympics and skimmed tens of billions of dollars off the top to enrich all the cronies who got the contracts, who then probably paid back Putin a massive cut, you know. And Orban was clearly the same thing. So her and her friends were like, let's start a petition drive to because this is gross. We don't like this. And they get two, over 250,000 signatures. And, and, and Orban withdraws. They win. He withdraws the Olympics bid because clearly there's this momentum for a referendum that will defeat it. And then they're like, let's start a political party. 
And they're like, we won't pick one on the left or the right. We're just going to start meeting with some friends around town and start a party you know, based on the idea that, you know, government shouldn't be corrupt. It should respond to kind of the basic problems that people have in their lives. It shouldn't discriminate against anybody. They went back to the basics. And they, they didn't do that well the first time, but then they're like, well, we have to go out into the rural areas. And they would show up and people would be like, who are you? Are you those puppets of George Soros? Because that's a thing in Hungary too. And they're like, no, we're these nice young people. We want to talk to you about the things that we believe in. And they started to win elections. And lo and behold, now the whole Hungarian opposition, not just because of these people, they're part of a broader movement where they're like, let's all put our differences aside and put a big tent over the entire opposition and run against Viktor Orban united together. And they have a real shot of taking this guy out next year in an election, even though he controls like everything because, the, because of people like this. Like, and what it's about, again, is like rooting yourself, anchoring yourself. This is a war about identity in a lot of ways. What does it mean to be American? That's why the subtitle of my book is you know, being American in the world we made. We have to figure out what does it mean to be American? What is that identity? And you, your book, Future Face, which everybody should read too, I mean, like, it, it, like these, these are the questions that are defining what it means to be Chinese, what it means to be American, what it means to be Russian. And there has to be a way. We were supposed to be the country that figured out that you could be from anywhere and believe anything and look like anybody and be an American. That's the whole idea of a multiracial, multiethnic democracy. It's not a coincidence that when we started losing our grip on that, like our example to the world started suffering too. Like if we can do that here, if we can show that you can have your, your individual identity, your local identity, your city identity, your, like that these things don't have to be an us versus them ethno-nationalist project, like America is supposed to have figured that out. And, and we can do that again. Okay, I have one last question, then we're going to turn it over to the, uh, I think we have one question from the audience. If anybody else has more, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, the work is urgent. It is, um, it is seen. <laughs> The threat is real, and yet, you know, the most devastating part of the book comes at the beginning when you're on a run on the Santa Monica coastline, and you can look out and see all that water and and the noise, the cacophony of, you know, the the evil and the instability and the injustice just recedes into the background, and it gives you this glimpse of like what it's like to numb yourself to the problems in the world, to not think of what's happening in Xinjiang province, what's happening in Tibet, what's happening in Burma, where my mother is from. And I think that that, as much as anything, is the battle ahead of us in the 21st century in, in Western wealthy nations, where we have a high standard of living, where we can just buy the stuff that, that's made in China because it comes to us fastest on Amazon, where we can watch the movies and not really give a shit if there was some censored scene that won't make a difference to the overall plot line. To, to accept entertainment and to accept the good life is in some ways also a trade-off with not fighting for the harder things in life, because sometimes the two can't coexist. And I guess, what's your advice to people as, um, you know, they finish this book and try and keep alive that sense of um, indignation and also empathy and excitement to do something about it and to forge new identities and not succumb to the numbness of a wealthy America, perhaps in the late stage of capitalism. Yeah, yeah. So to start in the dark place and end up in that more positive place, you know, I read this book when I, I, I did some deep reading on authoritarianism. I read this amazing book uh, when I was setting out to do this project called Darkness Over Germany. And it was a British writer who just traveled around Germany in kind of the early and mid -thir mid-30s after the Nazis came to power. And all she did is interview like ordinary Germans. And what she found is all these Germans who were not Nazis, um, but were basically, you know, acceding to it, uh, succumbing to it. Like teachers who are like told that they have to teach a Nazi curriculum and instead of quitting, they're like, well, if I quit, then there'll just be some worse teacher, uh, you know, or priests who literally had to put like pictures of Adolf Hitler up on the altar. And they're like, well, if I don't put the picture up, then I'll have to, you know, and everybody had a rationalization, you know, for basically why to, you know, acquiesce to this. And by the way, there's intimidation and threats of violence. So, um, but it planted the seed, and, and, and I think in a way, um, what, what is more, much more hopeful, but also much more, much more bearing of a responsibility, 
we have choice here. Like we, the people I know in Hong Kong don't have choices anymore. Like they, they've had to leave since that protest movement gets snuffed. Some of those people have had to leave the country. Um, Alexei Navalny's in a prison cell. Like we Americans, that like, could just were able to vote out Trump. Like we can, we can, we can win these battles. Um, we can make these choices ourselves, but we have to recognize the choices we've been making from a government level. Like, and I talk a lot about that, right? Obviously, um, but yeah, down to the individual level. Like, I describe that feeling of being able to run on the beach and and to not care, you know, or, or to not think about it or to be numbed to it. Um, and you could take that in any direction here in LA. Like, you could not think about the fact that this whole economy is built on undocumented labor. Uh, that is a profound commentary on American society and capitalism, you know, and that we all know and don't really do anything about. Um, you can go into pitch meetings in the entertainment industry out here, and trust me, the the documentary or feature film that is critical of the Chinese government is not going to get made. Um, but you have to be aware that that's contributing to like the direction of events that like the, the, the kind of, we decided, you know, in the, the cold war was far from a perfect time. <laughs> we made all kinds of mistakes. Right. But I think we did have a sense of like, there was this national identity that was rooted in some values. Like there was a, this competition between freedom and democracy, even imperfectly lived versus the other side. We weren't investing in Soviet technology. <laughs> like we weren't, we weren't, um, you know, uh, we, we had a values prism through which we saw the world. I think that the hope I give people is, I think this is quite reversible. I, like, we have a lot of agency here. We have agency, not, and it's not just waiting for Joe Manchin to, to get rid of the filibuster as much as I'd like him to do that. Like, we have agency. when we, If we organize at the local level, if you start organizations like Stacey Abrams does to, like, register people to vote, yes, communities like Pod Save the World, Pod Save America, where people want to to, to do something, they want to donate money or they want to knock on doors, they want to participate in political campaigns. Like we have voices that we could use and there's a proliferation of, of newer media, whether it's podcast or documentary film and stuff like what you do, Alex. Like, like at, at all levels from the US government, from the US president down to like a community organizer, like there are many more of us than them to, to, to reverse the us versus them frame us being people who like want to live in a society where people's fundamental values and dignity is respected. And, and I, I just think that like the hopeful thing now is I think people are aware of this. I mean, like that's, you, why are people buying a book about global authoritarianism? I think people, people, are people are aware of the problems with technology and disinformation. People are aware of the costs of, of inequality in our economy. People are over the post 9-11 forever wars. All these forces that I think have contributed to the negative trends like we are ready to move beyond this. Now, the huge impediment is the Republican Party. And it just has to be defeated. It has to be beaten. Like, but democracy gives us a vehicle to beat them without having to like clash in the streets like they would have had to do in like 1934 Germany here. So the hope is that we have agency. Um, I love that note. And I, I theoretically want to end on it, but there are a couple of really good questions, Ben, if you have another two minutes yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Um, from our audience. So let me, let me just read this one from Jake, uh, who asks one consistent theme of these autocratic regimes is that they are sprouting throughout the world that they're sprouting throughout the world are their unsustainable characteristics. Can you elaborate on how these regimes are able to hold on to their illegitimate grasp on authority within the countries and what democracies can do internationally to promote liberty and other democratic values? Does that start with securing democracy domestically first? Ahem, <laughs> Joe Manchin. Yeah. Much love from an incoming first year undergrad studying international politics. God, I wish I had questions like that when I was an undergrad. Wow, that's a great question. Yeah, shoot. See that the, the next generation is already smarter than <laughs> they're they're gonna save us so i mean the way i described this is that like uh the starting point for me for this to write this book was i was talking to this hungarian activist um you know you know the guy who says to me there's a playbook that orban ran you know capitalize on the right-wing populist backlash to the financial crisis redraw the parliamentary districts to entrench your party in power enrich cronies who buy up the media and turn it into a propaganda machine pack the courts with far-right judges, wrap it up in that nationalist message of us versus them, right? Um, 
this is the same playbook. The re- like Erdogan, Modi, Bolsonaro, like it, both the the playbook of hacking democratic institutions, you know, messing with the voting laws, messing with the courts, like, you know, taking control of the media through buy-ups and harassment. And, like, we can, we know it now. Like, we, we've seen it play out for, for in all these places. It's the exact same playbook. And the message is the same. The message is always the us versus them. We're the, make Turkey great again. Make Russia great again. Make Hungary great again. Like, this is not, like, rocket science what their playbook is, right? Now, what do we do in response? I mean, I think it is starting at home and p- therefore pushing back against the elements of that playbook at home. You know, like they are trying to overwhelm the courts and the media and, and the voting laws. And like, we have to fight them law by law, step by step and push back against this. And that's, again, why Joe mentioned so frustrating. But like, you know what? It's going to be a, a haul. It's going to take two years or four years or six years or eight years. But we have to, to fight them on like the, the Churchill fight them in the redistricting, fight them on the voting laws, fight them on the money in politics. Like that, we have to do. While at the same time dealing with these issues of, of identity, um, uh, like a, 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 of the fact that like a multiracial, multi ethnic dem- democracy is something to defend, where where you care about someone else's rights as much as your own. But I think internationally, the weak spot is that these people tend to be corrupt and incompetent. And we've just lived through that with COVID, right? I mean, Trump's in, probably would have gotten reelected without that, right? Um, but his kind of corruption and incompetence was exposed. Navalny had hit on Putin's weak spot because it was just exposing Putin's corruption. I think America can go abroad and expose these people's corruption. Nothing is stopping us from publicizing what we know about Vladimir Putin's ostentatious wealth. By the way, we can also go after the money that funnels these authoritarians. But you know what? That requires going and looking under the hood in places like New York and London where they launder their money, right? So we like this. We have to look inside of our own systems and be like, who's doing real estate deals with these people? Who is washing their money for them so that they can kind of take it back and be rich? And you know, so th- I think there's some pretty simple things, not simple, but they're pretty practical things that we can do to start to try to expose corruption and and choke off the lifeblood that they depend on. I think we need to regulate our own social media platforms so that they're not these perfect tools of disinformation and surveillance for them. I mean, like Facebook is just offering up to the Russians, like, hey, here's the perfect tool for you to p- promote your propaganda. Like, they don't need like, George, George Orwell's 1984 telescreen. They have Mark Zuckerberg creating a social media platform for them, you know? So they're, they're, these are things that there are a host of things that we can do, I think, um, to push back on this. Um, and... And the other thing I'd say is that like movements, there have been all these movements around the world, Hong Kong, Belarus, Chile and Colombia against inequality, climate strikes, like there's a lot of mass mobilization. And you may say to me, well, they're all failing. They are, but movements fail and fail and fail and fail until they succeed. And then it tends to be a breaking of a dam. And and so I think the other thing we can do is is very, you know, in every way, shape or form as a government and as a society, support democratic movements around the world in ways that I don't think we have. And then financially, I think with, with our, like with our moral authority, if we can reclaim some of it. Well, let's hope that we are on the beginning of reclaiming our moral authority and it began. Uh, moral la- authority is the wrong term, actually. I'd say solidarity. I mean, that's the problem. Yeah. Is it like moral authority is the wrong, that's, I, I've, I've not deprogrammed my, you know, <laughs> American exceptionalism enough, I guess, but like the, the, the book um, helps with that. Don't worry. Solidarity. I mean, but like a real meaningful solidarity because you know, it matters to people, by the way. This isn't me bullshitting you here. You talk to the people in Burma right now. They, they're they holding American flags when they go out to protest for a reason. Yeah. And it's yeah. not because they want America to invade. They want to feel like they are in solidarity with us. Well, and that's the conclusion I got to in my own book, which is your community isn't necessarily people who are linked to you by blood and soil. It's the community of people around you who share the same values, who understand the same touch points, who have the same feelings about the same things as you. And those people could live in Sweden or they could live in Yangon, they could live in North Dakota. That is our community of people on earth. And then we die. So find them and believe in them and be in solidarity with them because this is the work ahead of us. Ben, it's an incredible book. It's both hopeful and hopeless and hopeful again. And um, there's a reason that um, 
so many people are buying it and hopefully everybody that's watching this today will buy extra copies for uh, their friends and relatives and people they don't even know. Just hand them out on street corners. <laughs> everybody needs to read it, Book Soup. Um, we're talking to you, Book Soup. We're talking to you, Los Angeles <laughs> store shoppers. Um, thank you for writing it. Thank you for being who you are and surviving the washing machine of misinformation and the spin cycle of people trying to demoralize you. Your heart seems very much intact and we are thankful and blessed for that. So good luck with everything. Thank you guys for joining us for this book talk. Thank you book soup for existing and selling books, which are the things that are going to yes, save us. That's about that as important as anything. Yeah. Oh. Have to say, I love books, not biased at all. Okay. Um, congrats <laughs> again, Ben. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, as you say, I thank you, Alex. I mean, uh, were you gonna uh, say something? I was gonna say thank you, Alex, for, for doing this and for, yeah, I mean, I, I think your closing message summed up what I believe about other people, um, in ways that I, you know, that's the motivating factor. If you believe in other people, you know, you, 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 you activate. Yeah, beautiful and really important points made in the end here. That was a perfect way to close. Congrats, Ben, on your next book. Thank you both so much for being with us tonight. Thank you, everyone, for watching from Australia and everywhere. And support your local bookstores and authors. And everyone have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Good night.